Hey, what's up, Vox and Hopsheads? I'm Matt, the vocals of Cryptopsy, and you're listening to my podcast, where I normally sit down with fellow metal musicians and talk about their lives, music, and craft beer. But every once in a while, I love hooking up with some of the previous crew members that I've had the pleasure of working with throughout my years in Cryptopsy and traveling throughout the world. So I love to have a Vox and Hops crew talk where I sit down with tour managers, drivers, people that sell our merchandise, because these people are very important to what happens on tour. There would be no tours going on if there was no crew behind all the great artists out there putting on the shows. So you got to uh, appreciate and send some love to the crew sometimes. Devastation on the Nation 2020 is coming up. I hope that you guys got your tickets. This year's lineup is incredible. Featuring Rotting Christ, Borknagar, Wolfheart, Abigail Williams, and Imperial Triumphant. Some of these shows have already sold out, so if you don't have your tickets yet, you absolutely should, because more shows will sell out, and you will miss the show, and you will be disappointed, and you can't say that I didn't tell you so. You can get your tickets via the link in the description of this podcast, or you can simply go to MetalFestivalTours.com. Grab your tickets. Don't miss the party. Devastation on the Nation 2020. For the past few weeks, I've been releasing a new segment called Vox and Hops Metal Brewer Talks, where I sit down with metal brewers and we talk about their lives, their love of metal music, and how they got into brewing craft beer. If you are a metal brewer, or if you know a metal brewer, please send them my way because I want to talk to them. If you'd like to be a guest on the Vox and Hops podcast, being featured on Vox and Hops' Metal Brewer Talks, please send me a message via my social media pages, Instagram, or on Facebook, or you can simply send me an email to matt at voxandhops.com. That's M-A-T-T at V-O-X-A-N-D-H-O-P-S dot com. And I will let you know how all of this works. So here we go, another Vox and Hops crew talk. Hey, what's up, guys? This is Kaiser Dwayne from Hop Citizen, and you're listening to episode 97 of Vox and Hops with Donnie Hill. I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm with Donny Hill, and we are at Saint Buck Brasserie Artisanale on Saint Denis Street, Montreal. How are you doing, brother? It's so good to see your face. I'm doing really well. How are you? <laughs> good, good. I've had a good day. A bunch of interviews. Yeah. You're rounding it all up. Yeah. You got to keep the driver, the TM, the tour manager for last. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, we got to enjoy this uh, lovely weather that we're having here in Montreal today. So It's not snowing yet, so I'll take it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's part of the reason I left Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Let's tell everyone a little bit about yourself. As opposed to some of the people I interview, you are very important to making shows happen. Uh, you know, you're not necessarily on stage, uh, but you're very important. Tell uh, everyone what you do. Uh, well, I tour manage, I drive, I sometimes I do tech work, but yeah. How did that all come about? How did you become a tour manager, a stage manager, a driver, a merch guy? How did it all happen? <laughs> all right, well, um, after college, I started working at a, um, a metal and punk record label out of uh, Chicago. So I worked there for about a year, year and a half, uh, doing various like sales and publicity positions, and uh, met some people. I really liked what they did. And um, after I left the label, I kind of did some networking, and then uh, I met this guy named Steve Joe, who's one of the greatest people in the industry. So um, he gave me... Uh, a gig with Jeff Loomis uh, who didn't have like a manager or booking agent so it's kind of like a one man crew job so I was like road managing driving, doing merch like developing merch designs for him um, and then from there I kind of like just picked up uh, momentum working with various bands over the years, kind of like built it up um, like for, first I moved into uh, tour managing with a couple of progressive metal bands and um, then uh, st started filling up my schedule driving as well so how different is it going and working at a label versus being on the road well some of my first mentors in, in the industry um, their whole thing was for me to go further where I want to be that I have to under like truly understand the artist experience um, so whereas a lot of people just start off in the office and all they know is the office um, my 
whole thing w are was get, getting on the road, understanding logistics of the road, and like the full, like all the aspects that encompass the life of the artist. So um, yeah, just kind of like seeing where it develops from there. So uh, well, you definitely have done that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're ready to go back into the office now, Donnie. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, last couple of years I've been working on developing a few bands. Um, hopefully one of them will get to the point where I can truly manage them and have that kind of take me off the road a little more. It's here that or um, there's a couple of teams that I'm working with festival wise, just kind of seeing which one develops. So you have been you mentioned on the way as we were walking here. This is your 85th lap of North America. Yeah, I got really bored like two years ago and actually decided to count them. So Just imagine that. And you're on the road how many months a year? Uh, 10 to 11 months out of the year. So you're basically on the road more than all of your artists that you tour with. That's one way of putting it, yes. <laughs> how, how do you cope with that? How do you deal with it? It's kind of an extreme roller coaster. It definitely comes with its sacrifices. Uh, kind of miss out on all the holidays, all the birthdays, um, all the weddings, all the graduations. Uh, it's just kind of, it's kind of the sacrifices that you pay to uh, live the dream, so they say. <laughs> How do you have a social life at home? Is it possible? Um. Oh, it's, uh, it gets tricky here and there. So uh, as far as relationships, just kind of flying girls out here and there to places they've never been. But uh, I mean, I'm currently single, so <laughs> it's working well. That, that kind of speaks volume <laughs> for itself. So. <laughs> what about like past friendships, uh, your high school friends? Do you still have ties with friends at home? Uh, friends that I grew up with, um, their perception perception kind of changes but like i'm still the same guy just different life experiences you're so. just not there yeah so like um i grew up in north carolina i only really visit like once every two to three years outside of shows there so i mean part of that's on me but um like i still hang out with the same people and we it's just always catching up so uh, other than that, most of my closest friends for like the last decade or most of the people that I've like spent time on the road with, it essentially becomes like your second family. So there's something special that happens because we're all living the same thing. Except you live it so much more. <laughs> well, You're so immersed in it. I, yeah. I just can't imagine. Where do you even feel like when you go home that you're home? Oh, I mean. Home is essentially wherever I am surrounded by good company. At what point after all the years did you come to that realization? Oh, I, I've had it a few times over the last like four or five years especially. But um, it's like in 2010, whenever I first started, I moved out to Chicago not knowing anyone. But then uh, 2014, I moved out to L.A. But like my 13 closest friends uh, that are all in the industry all moved out there the same year, which made moving to Los Angeles a lot easier. So, Absolutely. We were just delivered a beautiful beer called Afonso. I remembered what style of beer you like. <laughs> you like red ales. This is Le Saint Bucks red ale called Afonso. It's uh, smooth. It's a little bit malty. It's good. It's nice. Um, Le Saint Buck always delivers excellent products, and I'm always proud to bring people here. Yes, sir. <laughs> All that being said, are you a craft beer enthusiast? To a degree. I like good beer. At what point of your life did you get to the point where you like good beer versus shitty beer? Or how do you define good beer versus <laughs> shitty beer is more my question. All right. Uh, I guess really in college, I, I kind of started a little bit early um, just because whenever I started drinking beer, I was never really a big fan of uh, like PBR, Ice House, Budweiser, any of that. But then 
I, I, I kind of got used to it, um, like as as my taste developed. But uh, I, I did always like Yingling though. That was like my first favorite beer. So, but then uh, there was a bar next to the college that I went to uh, called the Flying Saucer that had um, I want to say it was something like 106 beers on tap, and every Monday it was like 250 tap night, and so it was kind of like a goal to drink all the beers so that you could get your name on the plaque in but, one night. No, oh, no, 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 no. They, they, they had a limit of three per visit. So okay, good for them. Yeah, but th- there are people that had their name up there seven times. So wow. Okay. I I never accomplished that. So. <laughs> Traveling so much, being around, touring, you must have uh, visited a bunch of craft beer meccas. Do you have uh, your own particular favorite craft beer places? I mean, Surly's in Minneapolis stands out. We were just there last week, so uh, I mean, obviously, you know, Alex Kendrick really loves the spot. So shout out to Alexander Kendrick, <laughs> Vox and Hops alumni. <laughs> yep, yeah, and uh, I really like uh, Revolver Brewing out in uh, Texas. So um, they have Blood and Honey, which is my favorite beer in the country. So cool. What, what style of beer is that? It's a red ale again? It's like a, a blood orange and honey, like American ale. So it Sounds delicious. Yeah. yeah. I, and it's 8, 8%, so it's very smooth. It's tasty. Is there a point you, you want to go back into the office, get off the road? Do you think you'll ever be able to settle down? At some point, yes, but hopefully I'm able to get myself into a position where I'm still able to travel here and there, but uh, on my own accord, the places that I actually want to when I want to. So Is it almost at a point that you feel addicted to traveling oh yeah to moving absolutely because you're always in the same cities oh yeah i mean basically within two weeks of me being home i already have the itch to get back on the road again so it's either that or just keep traveling to another city because i realize just how easy it is to do so uh, a lot of people build it up in their mind like it's just this huge thing to visit anywhere but it's really for a couple hundred dollars you can go almost anywhere which if you compare it to like the price of gas really isn't much so that's true that's true yep but on these tour cycles that you're doing you're in the same cities same venues yep do you have like a a particular few favorite places when you see it pop up on a tour routing that you're like yes i'm going back to i know where i'm going to eat yep well uh Actually, yeah, that that that's another one of my favorite parts about touring is being able to, like, go to any food place around the country. You can watch Food Network or whatever, and then you'd be like, all right, I'm going to go there. But um, I guess my five favorite spots are fairly typical. It's... Uh, like I really like Denver, I like Austin, I like Dallas, um, I like visiting Seattle, and Chicago is always going to be my favorite of the major cities because it has just a little bit of everything. So, and what about the food places? Where do you like to eat? What are the top American places for Donny Hill to eat? Wow, top American places. Canada's boring. <laughs> I'm just going to say poutine. Oh. <laughs> um. Okay, uh, I guess I'll start off with uh, with pizza. I really like Antonio's out in Providence, Rhode Island, and Demos in Chicago. What about greasy, nasty food? <laughs> America's good for that. Oh, you mean like the like just going to Waffle House? <laughs> Could always uh, or the cardiac be, be, grill. Yeah. Oh wow, I forgot about that place. Uh, have you been there? No, I'm a vegan, so it's oh. no good for me at all. But <laughs> I'm just living vicariously through you right now. <laughs> Uh, uh, I mean, one of the best vegan spots I know of in the country would be uh, either Red Bamboo out in New York City or uh, the Chicago Diner, obviously in Chicago. So I have not eaten at either of those. No. Yeah. Let's talk about your love affair with Bucky's. Oh yeah, Bucky's. Uh, what, the, what is Bucky's in case people don't know because they've never been there in oh, Texas? Oh, if they've never been there, um, well, the easiest way to describe it, you first have to know what Wawa or Sheets is. 
<laughs> I don't know what those are. Those, let's go. Oh, all right. Um, damn. It's basically a giant truck stop. <laughs> yeah. Well, essentially, yes. It's they have a couple locations that only have about 300 um, pumps to use, but uh, only. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, they they have like a little bit of everything food-wise. It's actually like decent quality. It's almost like a Walmart meets Sheets or Wawa. But if you don't know what those are. I can't really help you, <laughs> but the uh, like they they make their own beef jerky. They make a lot of their own treats. They have like thirty different fudges. Um, they do pretty good pierogies. Yeah, a little bit of everything. Take me through one of your worst experiences on the road. <laughs> I'm sure you have many. Oh. Let's take me down a few of those because <laughs> people think it's all fun being on tour. Oh, the worst Let's experiences. Let's like the scariest ones. Oh, scary? I mean, back in 2016, I was shot in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, but... You were shot? Yes. Like on your body? Yeah. Well, I was very lucky for the situation because it, it was closer to a graze, really kind of like took a chunk chunk out of my leg. But If the bullet touched you, it, it, it you were shot. Yeah, that's that's uh, the closest I ever want to get to that experience. Um, where, where, how did this go down? You were on tour. Uh, well, I was on tour. Uh, I was with this band that was supporting Hell Yeah. Uh, we were at the Chameleon Club. Um, the band was actually from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, so the, the band all went home that night. Um, and me and the one other crew guy stayed at the Hotel Lancaster, like a block over from it. But uh, me and him were, uh, it was about 2 a.m. and we were having a smoke break outside. And because our, our bus call wasn't till 6 p.m. the next day, uh, we decided to go see like uh, like what there is to do after hours. Like we, we Where's the clubs? Yeah, well, we, we noticed that there was like two parking structures um, right across the street from us. And there was maybe like three or 400 people coming down and we realized there was a club letting out. So we kind of like posted up right there and um, like we were just going to try to like talk to some locals just for advice, whether it was food, somewhere to hang out, whatever. But uh, then this SUV pulls up like right across the street and just this dude steps out and just starts firing into the crowd. And really? like, the first two shots just sounded like an engine backfiring. Um, but then I was I was kind of like taking a drag and then like I heard two more. The, the fourth one I felt hit me and it was kind of like uh, it's kind of like a burning it's kind of a mix of burning and like a hot marble just going right across and I just looked down at my leg and it was like covered in blood but uh, I, I looked over at my uh, my buddy and he was just like yeah that's what you think it is and so we, we ended up ducking behind this column in the parking garage uh, until like the, the dude kept firing like a full clip um, then he, he loaded up a second one and then started driving down the street but the uh, police station was like maybe a block away so like they were immediately on the scene how many cars showed up uh like three or four but we we kind of like like I, I just wanted to clean up my leg because you didn't I, go to the hospital no it was just a graze it was a, yeah oh uh, it, it was it was a heavy graze but <laughs> basically, basically i wiggled my toes and um i realized really, that really? i was all right i've got nothing broken um i also realized that uh my front house engineer had uh weed on him and we were in lancaster pennsylvania and i really didn't feel like fucking with that so uh yeah holy but, shit uh, so we went up to the hotel, cleaned up, but by, by the time like I cleaned up all the blood, it was like just really a really gnarly, gnarly scrape. And so I kind of like banched it up uh, just for the night and I w went to an urgent care and got some things taken care of. But uh, they, they ended up catching the guy a few days later and turns out he just saw his ex-girlfriend in a club with her new boyfriend and decided to shoot up the crowd. So Unbelievable. But the thing is, is the moment I looked at the guy that was shooting, there's a guy in an affliction shirt and buckled jeans. So there's nothing hard about this story whatsoever. <laughs> I, I just had to look at it as like, th this is the punk ass bitch that gets to shoot me. So, but, uh, a few inches, you know, it yeah, yeah, been a little literally, literally inches 
could have changed my life right there. Yeah. So that's... And you kept on the tour. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> You're a warrior. Uh, well, I mean, I already been through so much before that I didn't want to be a bitch. So, And I, I didn't want to do that when I was on tour with Vinnie Paul. So, <laughs> Sick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Epic tour story. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, 2013, whenever I was with uh, Jeff Loomis, we were like the second band to get robbed in St. Louis. But I had so much... Robbed how? Like the trailer was broken into? Or well, the, robbed? Uh, basically, we left the venue and uh, we stopped at a Jimmy John's for like 11 minutes. And in that time, they broke into our van and just jacked everything that we had in there. So um, Jeff Loomis was touring in a van? Yeah. Wow. Basically, it was van and hotels every night. Okay, so, okay, okay. Yeah. Because that, that was uh, tour. It was 55 shows in 57 days. Holy shit. Like uh, that, that night was actually an overnight drive from St. Louis to... To Dallas, so, but um, we ended up just kind of rallying together. Uh, Soul Work gave us a $500 loan just to make sure that we didn't drop off the tour right then. But uh, it's, it's a very humbling experience whenever that happens, especially once you realize how quickly it can happen. Just everything gone. Yeah. Uh, everyone's personals. Yeah. Laptops. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but we, we weren't missing any gear because the gear was in Soil Works trailer. So. Okay. But all your personals just got yep. passports. Yeah. Just a, a lot of things. So, yeah. It's a, it's a very, it's a moment that makes you feel very naked. So, um, but we ended up doing the overnight drive to Dallas, um, made this post, which I guess a publicist decided to add on to a bunch of websites. But um, we, we had like a PayPal donation thing and like we, we ended up getting to the hotel about like, 3 or 4 p.m., like, took a nap before we ever went to the show. I mean, we, we obviously missed the load-in because uh, it was kind of a heavy moment. But uh, we ended up waking up probably about, like, 7.30, 8 o'clock. And by that point, like, so many people had already donated. And then, like, going through and uh, reading the messages that everyone was leaving, especially, like, all the artists, like, from the community. Um, but Jeff Loomis is a king, so. Yeah, yeah. so it was. Like, kind of made you believe in humanity again. So uh, that, and then once we got to the venue, uh, Soil Work had made a donation box, and they had already like people in Dallas had already donated like seven hundred dollars plus. Wow! By the time we got there, so we we ended up just kind of paying back the five hundred dollars that we were loaned like right away, but. Like it, it was a moment that that kind of helped us rally together and then finish the tour. So there's still some humanity in the world. Yeah, yeah, especially in the metal scene. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it, it was a really really cool moment. So let's talk about you. You work uh, for the past four years as the tour manager, stage manager for Summer Slaughter. Let's talk about that. How did that all start? Take me through the ropes of what Summer Slaughter feels like <laughs> as the tour manager. Oh, um, well, before I did Summer Slaughter, um, like while I was still tour managing Tesseract, I started uh, tour managing another tour called the All Stars Tour before that. And then that kind of led into uh, Summer Slaughter. And I guess the easiest way to explain it it's very, very long days. It's usually like 10 a.m. load in. I'm not usually done till my with my day until like 1 a.m. So, so you, you get paid. Oh, yeah. Like you take everyone's pays and you, you, you give it yeah. everyone's pays. Yeah, ba basically, I... I kind of like act as the the middle middleman between like all the all the bands and the promoters. Uh, I make sure that the venues have everything that we need, M make it as easy to understand as possible. I uh, get all the audio engineers to work together, create a festival patch, and just like generally like work as a unified team together, um, making sure that we have good communication with everyone, just to make the day run as smoothly as possible, and then. Um, then take care of everything on the promoter side of things and I collect the money and then I divvy it out to the bands every night so make sure that they're all paid what they're owed so and you're doing crazy days that's from 10 to 2 
That's crazy. That's that's an insane and horrible day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically it turns into like 108 hour work weeks. Uh, like this year, we had a 19 day stretch without a single day off. So that was. That's interesting. <laughs> Being a tour manager comes with dealing with promoters. How do you deal with delinquent promoters? Uh, <laughs> oh, I mean, basically after so many laps, you just kind of develop you develop a rapport with most of them. Uh, it's always the same people. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, fortunately, we usually have the leverage where. The promoters aren't so shady anymore. It's basically um, with a festival like that, you're working with so many different managers and agents that if there are issues, you, you basically end your career as a promoter. So I, I understand. It's, yeah, it's yeah, usually yeah. fairly smooth. <laughs> <laughs> but in in the circumstances in your past, can we, you share me some stories of how you've dealt with some delinquent promoters? Basically, some people just need a very stern talking to. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I've always gotten all my bands paid 100%. So. Really? Good for you. Whether it's in gear or... <laughs> oh, no. I always get the money. You, have you done the, the drive to the ATM? Um, it, it's usually just helping them realize that they do have cash in the safe from the bar sales. So <laughs> it's just just understanding the big picture of things, <laughs> especially once they realize I'm not leaving until I have the money. So you just get comfortable. Yeah, <laughs> just get really comfortable. I mean, usually being bigger than them kind of helps, but fortunately, that's uh, that's happened fewer times than than it has. So I mean. I guess the roughest I've gotten, I'm not even going to name the band, but uh, I had a promoter that he tried to do the whole waiting me out thing, and uh, so that, that was a tour where my sleep's very important to me, especially on some of the tours where it's multiple positions, and so I ended up just having to take a knife out and kind of start carving into his desk a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, but I mean, that that, that was called. See, he he kind of like pushed some limits there that didn't need to be pushed. But he he became uh, his memory became very clear after that about where the money was, and then <laughs> I, I was out of there in like 15 minutes. So it only took five, four hours to get to that point. When you're a promoter, it's your responsibility. To make sure people are there. Yeah. It's not the bands. Yeah. You chose to promote a show. The bands will gladly share your promotions. Yeah. But at the end of the day... You agree to a contract. It's your responsibility <laughs> to pay the bands. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Summer Slaughter hit a bit of a dip. Not this previous year, the year before. They recouped themselves very well. Where do you think Summer Slaughter is going? Well, it's, uh, it's definitely on the way up. So, uh, especially with some of the bands that um, that we're already talking to this year. So, it's definitely has an up upward tra trajectory. So, um, the main thing is just keeping the diversity there. So, that way, s someone that enjoys, like, people that enjoy a little bit of multiple things will all come together un under one roof. So, I have a lot of respect for them. Uh, my first American tour was Summer Slaughter 2008. Ooh. So, uh, you know, Cryptops, you could be a part of the next one. Oh, maybe so. <laughs> Donnie, thank you so much for coming, sharing a craft beer with me at Le Saint-Buc Brasserie Artisanale. Happy that we got together. Cheers, brother. Cheers. Hey, thank you all so much for listening right to the end. Donnie, such a cool dude, such a great guy. I had the pleasure of meeting him last year when he was my driver on Hell Over North America featuring Aborted, Benighted, and Hideous Divinity, and we immediately hit it off. He is actually the person that gave me the idea to start asking fans to bring out craft beers in exchange for guest list, which is something that I'm going to keep doing in the future and is something that I really enjoyed. Obviously, I got to connect with a whole bunch of craft brew heads all throughout the states and taste a whole bunch of craft beers that I hypothetically wouldn't have and I got to hang out with these people 
get to meet them, uh, show my gratitude, and give them some guest lists so they can come and see the show for free. So a uh, huge shout-out to Donnie Hill. He is a tour warrior. As we mentioned, he's on tour more than any of the artists that he's with. So if you're going out to see a metal show in your town, there is a high probability that Donnie's there. So keep an eye out for him and give him a hug for me. As always, the best way to support the Vox and Hops podcast is by simply talking about it. You can go out and tell your craft beer loving friends, your metalhead friends about the Vox and Hops podcast. Sharing it is the best way to do that. If you'd like to take it one step extra, you can go to the Vox and Hops Big Cartel page and pick up some of the merchandise that I have up there. Right now, I have a pre-order for the Vox and Hops When in Doubt, One More Stout still up there. This is another limited edition shirt designed by Andrew Tremblay, the graphic artist that I use for all the Vox and Hops graphic art. He is amazing, and I love working with him. Those shirts will be available for pre-order for another few weeks, and then they're going to be gone. That's it. You're going to miss the boat if you don't pick up a One in Doubt, One More Stout shirt within the next few weeks. We also have the Cuff Knit Vox and Hops beanies. I sincerely only have a few of these left, so if you want one, you should pick one up really soon. And I also have a few of the Vox and Hops branded glassware. This is a 9-ounce tasting glass. The exact style of glass I honestly use is at my house all the time. It's all I've been drinking my beer from since I received them, and I just love them so much. They feel great, uh, they look great, and I'm so stoked to have them. All of these are available on the Vox and Hops Big Cartel page. The link for that is in the description of this podcast. I hope you guys had a great Christmas. I hope you've had a great holiday season. It's not over yet. New Year's is coming up. Everybody drink responsibly. Plan your way home. I want you guys to drink craft beer responsibly. I want you guys to be safe. I want you guys to get home safe. It's always important to plan your trips home when you go out and celebrate. Make sure that your drivers are sober and can get you home safely. Nothing will bother me more than hearing about some Vox and Hops heads not making it back. So plan ahead, take care of yourselves, and remember to enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. Cheers, Vox and Hops heads. Oh,